we are going to start with a presentation from the Center for the American Experiment. We have Kim Crockett and Catherine Kirsten around here. And they're just going to give a brief overview of, of what the Met Council is about to kind of give us a framework to begin a discussion. And I would really like to just have this as a very open discussion. We have a lot of very important people in here. Stop and <laughs> Except for Tony Albright. And, and please excuse um, my rudeness of not introducing you. You're all important. But if you do stand up and want to have a discussion, please um, introduce yourself, who you are, and where you're from, so that we can have a context. We have those technical issues. I'm Kim Crockett from Center of the American Experiment, and I'll just give you a quick infomercial. Uh, one of the pieces on the back table is the paper that Kathy and I wrote and released back in uh, 2014 on the Metropolitan Council. It was one of 10 chapters in something called the Minnesota Policy Blueprint. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, really? I never hear that. Usually I'm told to be a little quieter. Um, so the Minnesota Policy Blueprint is a, is a book that we released in uh, January of 2015. But over a period of months in 2014, we released each chapter to an audience that we thought would be interested. Uh, this was one of those chapters. Uh, and so if you're interested in the others, they are on our website under the Minnesota Policy Blueprint logo where you could click on them. And in addition to the chapters themselves on taxes, energy, transportation, my favorite, public pension funding. Ooh, it's a hot topic. There's also PowerPoints, uh, including something very similar to what I'm hoping you will get to see today uh, in the PowerPoint slide. So, then I'll just look at you. How are we doing? Well, we don't really need the PowerPoint, but I thought, I thought we had it there. And you guys, don't be shy. We do have some seats up here. so And I know a lot, a lot of people are coming and going, so don't feel like you're rude. We understand you all have busy lives. Well, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, I will be speaking briefly about uh, the Met Council and its, its policies as represented in the new uh, planning framework for IBMSP 2040. And then Kim will move to a broader topic, which is Met Council governance. <coughs> Very good. So the, the Met Council was created in the mid-1960s with a limited, straightforward vision. And that was to accommodate growth uh, through orderly, efficient planning of regional infrastructure here in the seven county Twin Cities area. Uh, but the council's accountability and credibility gap, as Minnesota's legislative auditor has called it, has widened over the years. And that's a result of the legislature's piling on powers while failing to provide any meaningful in, uh, oversight. Now, the council, of course, is composed of 16 uh, members and a chair, all of whom are appointed by the governor, and they're answerable only to him. As a result of this, today the citizens of the Twin Cities metro area are burdened by what's becoming an unaccountable regional government that is neutering the power of our local elected officials, dictating to and even overruling them. The Met Council's assault on local control has reached a watershed, we believe, with Thrive MSP 2040, which, as I said, is the 30-year framework for development in our Southern County area. Peter, uh, next slide, please. With Thrive, uh, the Council is using its dual role as a planning czar and a funding gatekeeper to pick winners and losers among the region's 186 or so municipalities and is imposing its own sweeping priorities on local communities as a condition for their receipt of funds and planning approval. Local officials must acquiesce and fall into line because in too many cases they're unable to object on behalf of their constituents for fear of retaliation. Here. The Thrive Plan is based on a fundamental assumption. And that is that central planning by unelected social planners is a key to the Twin Cities region's continued prosperity and high quality of life. 
In fact, our region's success to date is due not to central planning by bureaucrats, but to the enterprise and the entrepreneurship and the hard work of its citizens. The Mint Council's power grant and thrive raises a vital question. Will the people of the Twin Cities region continue to govern their own communities through their elected representatives as they have a right to do? Or will the Mint Council increasingly usurp the authority to decide how we live and what the character of our communities will be. <coughs> the Thrive Plan, we believe, epitomizes what Forbes.com columnist Joel Kotkin has said about smart growth planners generally. The people designing your city don't care what you want. Now, next slide, please. The Thrive Plan has four <coughs> fundamental objectives. The first is to densify our region and to impose transit-oriented development, which is designed to remake our region around transit, to nudge us into high-density stack and pack housing along fixed rail lines, to deplete road funding and increase congestion, and to push us out of our cars so that we walk, bike, and take public transit to work and leisure activities, even in Minnesota's harsh winters. The second objective, is to empower unelected bureaucrats to funnel jobs and economic growth into our region's favored urban center and also areas within half a mile of transit stations. In this way, distorting market forces and sapping development in the rest of our region. The third objective is to remake our neighborhoods and municipalities to apportion people in a government-approved mix of race, ethnicity, and income allocating poverty across the metro area, and pressuring cities to plan and use their fiscal resources for low-income housing. The fourth objective is to redistribute wealth from the suburbs to the urban core in order to pay for all of this. Under the new plan, suburban residents will likely pay more in taxes, but get less in infrastructure and in services. This, though, is just the beginning of the Mid Council's ambitions. In Thrive, the unelected council maintains that its mission now includes uh, solving complex social problems like income inequality and the racial learning gap in our schools, as well as mitigating climate change. And these are matters under which the legislature simply has not given the Mid Council authority. In fact, the council uh, plans to make what it calls equity and climate change, quote, lenses through which to view all of its planning going forward. It lacks statutory authority to do this. Nevertheless, it's now taking a step, uh, appointing an equity advisory council, which will help shape virtually every policy going forward with racial statistical parity as a central focus. Next slide. Housing. Housing is not a statutory system over which the legislature has given the Met Council authority. Yet the council has adopted an unprecedented 140-page housing policy plan, which is overflowing with top-down controls. The plan will unleash a crusade to remake our metro region in a, quote, denser, more compact form. It mandates, quote, development patterns, in both developed and developing suburbs that, quote, support high transit demand to, quote, improve residents' ability to live without a personal vehicle. In other words, it calls for herding the region's people into dense urban enclaves to build ridership for fixed rail transit and buses. And as one critic has lamented, do we all have to live in a 1,500-foot condo above a coffee shop yeah. on a transit line? <laughs> well, under the plan, communities like St. Louis Park, uh, Hopkins, and South St. Paul uh, will have overall density expectations of 20 <coughs> units per <coughs> acre, like uh, MSP, like Minneapolis-St. Paul, despite their suburban character. And this is what their system statements uh, say. Uh, the last I heard developing or developed suburbs like Minnetonka in particular, uh, this city in particular must plan to increase density by about 30% through redevelopment. The plan threatens to push so much 
of our region's land into high density zoning, but that it will create an artificial shortage of single family zoned land, causing higher prices for all new housing in the region. But of course, the Mid Council can't change people's housing preferences whenever it thinks. And if people can't get what they want here, they will leapfrog out beyond our seven county metro area or perhaps even move to other areas of the country where they can get the housing that they want and can afford. The Thrive Housing Plan also aims to achieve a government-approved apportioning of people on the basis of skin color and income. And in 2013, the council mapped every census tract in our seven county area by race, ethnicity, and income, dividing them into several categories, including uh, racially concentrated areas of poverty and high opportunity clusters. And with its housing plan now, it essentially aims to overlap one uh, on top of the other. Uh, the plan requires cities to plan for and accommodate precise, arbitrarily determined numbers of taxpayer-subsidized high-density housing for low-income people, whether these units actually are likely to be built or not. Let's talk about Burnsville. Just looking at the, uh, at the system plan, my understanding is that Burnsville already has a high percentage of affordable housing, something like 79%. Uh, affordable to people who are at or below 80% of adjusted median income. Nevertheless, uh, the, the Met Council has assigned an affordable housing need of 266 units to Burnsville, and about half of those must be affordable to very low income families, about $25,000 income for a family of four. And overall, the Met Council plans to locate new uh, low income housing as much as possible in the higher income regions or areas of our region uh, and also on the suburban edge. And in, in places like, say, Andover, up north, places uh, that lack uh, access to public transit or to public assistance related services or job training, people in poverty will oftentimes simply be set up for failure. The council says that its affordable housing plan will require more than $5 billion in public subsidies between 2021 and 2030. And today, the average subsidy for metro area affordable housing units, not including, uh, including single occupancy dwellings, is a whopping $185,000 per unit. And in some cases, uh, subsidies are much higher. If you look at the per unit costs, for example, of Fort Snelling and Pillsbury uh, projects, Pillsbury AVOS, uh, those per unit costs are a jaw-dropping $526,000 in the case of Fort Snelling and $693,000 in the case of the Pillsbury AVOS, respectively, per unit. By contrast, the median home price in Minneapolis-St. Paul is about $229,000. That's just 24% more than the public subsidy for average new affordable units. Now, under the law, the council has no authority to enforce these kinds of affordable housing directives. But in the Thrive Plan, the council is attempting to strong arm cities into complying with its directives by tying receipt of the transportation funds. It includes funds intended to relieve congestion and to improve safety, tying those funds receipt to how much a city's housing policies disperse regional poverty. <coughs> Next slide. A top quality road system is of course vital to the Twin Cities continued prosperity and high quality of life. And here's why. A key to regional growth and prosperity is how many jobs people can access within a commute time of 30 minutes. And in our region, only 11% of jobs are located in Minneapolis and St. Paul, in downtown uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. Our region is very spread out, and the average employee here can only reach 7% of jobs uh, by transit within 45 minutes. So under these circumstances, cars are, and they're likely to remain the fastest and the most convenient way to get to the vast majority of jobs. But uh, the Thrive Transportation Plan's focus is on transit-oriented development, which disfavors cars and which favors rail transit, biking, and walking. 
And over time, this policy is likely to seriously reduce opportunity in our area and sap prosperity. So this transportation plan, I want to use some quotes here, declares that, quote, expanding the roadway system is not a sustainable way to address congestion, climate change, equity, or livability. And the plan instructs cities to consider, quote, travel modes other than the car at all levels of development. I think it's really hard to exaggerate the anti-auto bias of the Thrive Transportation Plan, which is crammed with fuzzy ideological language of this kind. And under the plan, uh, the freedom of mobility that we now <coughs> enjoy with our personal automobiles is likely to be increasingly curtailed. While the plan virtually ignores funding for road expansion, it lavishes funds on fixed rail, which is an inflexible 19th century technology, <coughs> although about 90% of area trips today are to use roads in some way. Uh, nevertheless, uh, only 2% use rail, and that's where uh, a very disproportionate amount uh, of, of money and the vision of the transportation of the Met County is focused these days. Next slide. In a unanimous statement uh, issued on September 29, 2014, the county commissioners from the five ring counties, Monoka, Carver, Dakota, Scott, and Washington, declared that Thrive's transportation plan, quote, represents a bleak future for the regional highway system in most counties. The plan's failure to reflect the metro area's actual transportation needs and growth habits will have a dire consequences for the entire region, said the commissioners, and for greater Minnesota as well. Uh, the commissioner said the plan will provoke a, quote, radical shift in how the transportation system is built and operated, causing, quote, severe congestion and safety issues, quote, impacting the suburban county's tax base and quality of life, and, quote, reducing the economic vitality of our region. Thrive's anti-suburb bias, which the commissioners deplored, is particularly <coughs> indefensible when you realize that in the next 25 years, only 16% of our region's population growth will be in Minneapolis St. Paul and 84% in the suburbs, according to the council's own figures. But soon, metro area citizens will learn what the Thrive Plan actually means for their city. Last September, the council issued systems statements to all city councils <coughs> containing those details. Details about density expectations, affordable housing, parks, transportation, water, and the like. And cities will now be using these system statements to update their comprehensive plans, which must be submitted to the council by 2018, in 2018. And in coming months, uh, local officials will select the citizen advisory committees uh, that will be involved in helping to draft these updates. I think it's really vital that the people involved in that effort understand Thrive's overreach and the challenges that it presents to local government, local control. Next slide. Thrive's intrusive top-down controls threaten to raise our cost of living, to reduce disposable income, and to increase poverty in our region. We can expect the Med Council's densification and transit-oriented development crusades to raise housing prices and the cost of driving, <coughs> and to make it much more difficult for people of all income levels to access a wide range of jobs as they search for the employment that best meets their needs. But Thrive is only a symptom of a much larger problem. Uh, the problem is planning and regulatory overreach by a regional planning organization that lacks accountability and credibility, according to Minnesota's legislative auditor. And Kim will give you thoughts on that. <laughs> Can everybody here, Kathy, all right? Mm -hmm. well, this is the sweeter spot in the room than wherever I was in the middle before. Um, so before we get to what's to be done, let's remind ourselves. The Metropolitan Council 
was created to provide for the orderly and economic development of the Twin Cities metro area. And it has the responsibility given to it by the legislature and the authority to guide, but not direct, the region's growth and to provide for important regional services like wastewater, wastewater treatment. So just keep that in mind as, 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 we, as we talk. Now, there is no other regional government quite like the Metropolitan Council anywhere in the United States. Ask yourself, why do we need a regional government <laughs> appointed or elected when we already have local county and state officials? The council, which has a budget of nearly $1 billion, which by the way has gone up just several hundred million a year, you know, each year that Kathy and I have been focused on this, is not designed to be accountable to the people it governs or even to the people that we have elected to govern us at the city and county level. To be clear, Thrive per se is not the problem. It is unbridled regionalism. Thrive is simply an advanced symptom of the governance problem that we need to solve. Another symptom, as Kathy pointed out, what we see in Thrive is the council attempting to expand its own power, for example, into housing as a system without legislative permission. Citizens are supposed to look to the governor and the legislature for oversight, but unfortunately the promise of oversight Mr. Zeller has failed. So, the good news is the legislature can fix this. And the bad news is only the legislature can fix this. The mistake that the legislature has made over and over again is thinking that it can vest authority in a body that is not accountable to the people who must live with its decisions or the people they elect to represent them, including the legislature. And though it may be politically impossible right now, as a matter of sound public policy, the center recommends that the Met Council be unwound in an orderly fashion, much like when AT&T was broken into baby bells. In 2011, the Legislative Auditor's Office found uh, that the transit, uh, the transit policy in the Twin Cities uh, was touched by 25 different organizations. That there is a great deal of inefficiency, dysfunctionality, and relationships strained by overlapping responsibilities <coughs> and distrust. So in other words, we have the burden of regionalism without really any of the benefits. Because if the Met Council was working, we would have a well-funded, long-range transportation plan with, with wide buy-in uh, from the region. Now, Jim Noble's office did not conclude that the Metropolitan Council should be broken up into baby bells, but it did recommend strongly that the council's government structure be reformed by adding elected officials <coughs> to the council. So, while we strongly urge the legislature to consider an orderly transition back to local and state control of the region, we recognize it's not going to happen, this section. But that does not mean that the legislature has not been hearing from local officials and citizens. In fact, the volume is way up uh, due to Thrive 2040, and today's <coughs> gathering uh, is just uh, more evidence of that. Next slide. So it may take a while a legislative session or two before the legislature updates the governance structure of the Met Council. In the meantime, big policy decisions are being pushed through that will commit our state and region to light rail and transit-oriented development for generations. This means that roads are being ignored in favor of fixed rail lines and those lines are designed to drive all new development in the region. The, as Kathy said, the plan favors four cities over the suburbs and outstate Minnesota, but the suburbs and outstate Minnesota will be tapped to fund it. 
We have therefore called for a moratorium on all new light rail projects to focus what we have already in, uh, uh, as substantial revenues on expanding roads, taking care of the roads, and building more flexible, less costly bus transit system. And let the newly constituted council that hopefully some of you will be part of in designing decide what the metro area's transportation needs are rather than an unaccountable body that has so little credibility with many cities and a majority of the counties in the metro area. Next slide. So the council's tenure and lack of on the ground data has brought bipartisan legislative and regional factions together. The, uh, the House of Representatives <coughs> has formed a subcommittee chaired by Representative Linda Runbeck. As Kathy said, the five suburban counties have been in revolt, uh, critiquing in detail the transportation plan and I believe the housing plan. Four of the counties have hired a lobbyist to help them make the case that the Metropolitan Council is not properly constituted to receive federal funds, federal transportation funds, because it is not uh, made up of a preponderance of <coughs> officials. There is now a Twin Cities local government coalition asking cities to sign up in their effort to reform the governance structure, and senators and state representatives from both parties are ta actively talking to each other uh, at the Capitol about what's to be done. Even the Citizens League, which found, helped found the uh, Metropolitan Council back in the 60s, when I was a little girl here in Minnesota, uh, has formed a, a task force uh, that will hopefully be a helpful part of the conversation. And finally, Governor Dayton has appointed Adam Dunnick as the new chair, and, and the chair has acknowledged that uh, before Southwest Light Rail should proceed uh, as a project that the state ought to provide its portion of the funding rather than the council simply funding the, the project uh, themselves. So the three principles I want to leave you with are add local input and control to bring boots on the ground information and common sense to the region. Two, uh, add meaningful legislative oversight of the Metropolitan Council's budget and spending. Third, reassert legislative control over the Council's mission so that the Met Council does not frustrate, for example, local and state policies on transportation or housing, or take on missions like the Achievement Gap, global warming, and income inequality. That is simply beyond their pay grade and scope. And this is where you as elected officials or citizens come into the equation and where you can make a difference. Please join your citizens advisory committee. System statements have gone out. I've got a copy of Burns Bills with me uh, today. And over the summer I'm told citizen advisory committees will be forming all over the region. And you can be part of the feedback on what the council has said about housing, transportation, and so on and so forth. And perhaps get your city signed up with the Twin Cities Local Government uh, Coalition to be part of the governance solution. Because frankly, I'll, I'll share with you, uh, I mean, my bias, I, as I've said, centers <coughs> bias is to unwind this Leviathan. But don't try to fix it. I'm worried that if you try to fix it, uh, you'll, just get, you'll just get more of the same in the future. But we're the realists, uh, and we'll, we're happy to go with the good recommendations of the Office of the Legislative Auditor. This is the 2011 report, and it's right on the OLA's website if, you, if you'd like to go out and find, and find a copy. Now keep in mind, again, as I started out at the beginning, the Metropolitan Council was created to provide for the orderly and economic development of the region. It has responsibility to guide 
but not direct the region's growth. And it must do so with the input of elected officials and citizens. Thanks. My understanding is that we're going to try to have a conversation. Uh, Roz, do you want to? Well, absolutely. Thank you very much. And this is to give a little bit of a framework of, of where we've been and, and where we are today. I want to thank all of you for being here. I just love the, the um, enthusiasm to be a part of this conversation. Now comes sort of the hard part. And uh, I personally feel like this is an opportunity. We have a governor who is open to seeing some changes. He uh, will not be running for re-election and we can potentially frame some legislation that will be in effect for the next governor, for example, as, as one idea. And uh, I know that we have several <coughs> commissioners here that have also come up with some plans. I know each city has, has other ideas as well. And the idea is that if we can all have a conversation together, that hopefully we can come up with something that will make sense for all of us. Because at the end of the day, we want to do what's best for Minnesotans. We do have Representative Linda Runbeck here today, who is the chair of the, as you saw, the, the title, the subcommittee on Met Council Reform. However, this is a metro issue, and we need to come together as a metro to come up with some viable solutions before we can really even take it to the next level at the Capitol. So just as it was sort of already explained before, let's talk about those different ideas. Um, one of the ideas that is out there is having uh, people being appointed from the local representation. So for example, the city council members would come up with a uh, person to represent them at the Met Council, so then that person would be um, beholden to the people that they brought there versus right now, which is Governor Dayton, or whichever governor it happens to be. And uh, that is just one of the ideas that's out there. But I am open to taking questions, um, not from me personally, but maybe from some of the experts. And, and maybe even just throwing out what, what you think might, might make some sense. Yes. Can I? Uh, oh, and ask? please um, announce your name and who you are. Uh, my name is Don Lee. I live over in uh, Eden, and I'm running for house this time around. Uh, I'd like a little bit of background on the Met Council. I've been, I've been really impressed by how the Met Council uses what little authority it has <laughs> to work its way in and control so much. They, they control the sewers, and they go out to all the communities and say, if you want to do any development, you have to answer to us. And I'm just wondering, can I get just a, a brief overview of what their legitimate functions are, where they get their money are, and what, what are their legitimate powers? <laughs> I would think that yeah, an elected official might, might want to respond to that. Linda, do you want to? Uh, I, you know, it's um, been spoken many times in the committee of uh, their powers starting back in 67 and on into 70, 1974, a little more expansion at that point. Um, but clearly to, to bring together the decisions about wastewater and, and sewers is where it started. You know, and, and those are very, very big costs. Sewers are important. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they are, they're pretty fundamental. Uh, and uh, they have that power. I mean, they run that, the wastewater plants, you know, they run, I guess, how many? 10 or 12 different wastewater treatment plants. So they've got the infrastructure, uh, and they employ all the people. I mean, that's their baby. So from there, you know, things have gotten uh, be less, less defined, but they clearly have the, the authority to decide and define. And then, of course, MUSA, the MUSA line. Everybody familiar with that? The Metropolitan Urban Sewer Area, and that's defined by a boundary. Uh, the, I thought, and maybe Mary Liz probably knows more than anybody in the room, but uh, it was interesting to me to know that initially, when the Met Council decided where that MUSA line should be drawn, it was in the mid-70s when everyone thought the Twin Cities was going to be 4 million people by 1990. <laughs> so they were, it was a very generous boundary. And the fact that 
nobody's really bumped up you know, to it in a too stressed way is only by virtue of the fact that it was drawn way too ambitiously. So at some point, um, it will be used. It will be used as a hard and fast, you know, you can't do anything else, you know, outside that boundary line, or we'll tell you what to do inside the boundary line. So uh, I think that's just, um, you know, sort of a rough, rough idea. But then roads in the mid-90s, um, Metro Transit, the bus system came under the, the authority also of the Met Council. So that, that's two big pieces in you know, what gets decided as the communities develop. Do you want me to add on to Absolutely. That? Are you Wendy? I'm Wendy Wolf. Okay. I am a Met Council member. I've been on the Met Council since 2009. So I was appointed by Governor Palenti and I've been reappointed by Governor Dayton three times. I've been confirmed by both a Republican Senate and a Democrat Senate. So. Hopefully there isn't anybody in the room that really hates me, because <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, like we do the sewers, and, and that was where we had, you know, before the Met Council took over the sewers, people were just in these individual towns having systems where you kind of let the solids settle out and you put the liquid in the river and everybody's happy. Well, that makes for a pretty nasty river, and so, we were asked to clean up the problem, and we have. And the, the water that comes out of our wastewater treatment plants is actually far cleaner than the rivers that it's going into. It's generally clean enough to drink if you're a little bit brave. <laughs> I, I offered once, and they were afraid to let me. Um, we do the, the transfer transportation planning for the, the metro area. Oh, and one thing, the sewers are entirely funded on their own from user fees, connection fees, and the, the bill that you pay to your cities for how much you flush the toilet. There's no tax money at all that goes into our, our sewer systems, and it runs really, really well. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only is it a, a model across the country for the cleanliness of what we do with the water, it costs 40% less than the average around the rest of the country. So I, I, I really think our sewer system is something to brag about. On transportation, we do the planning, but we don't do the funding, which is kind of a weird situation. The legislature decides how much money goes for roads of the various pots of money, and they decide how much goes for transit operating. There was a vote back in 2008 which created CTIP, which came up with all of this money for the, the light rail. Um, but the only money that we levy is for transit capital projects, and that each year we have to go back to the legislature and say, this, these are the projects that we want to le levy for, and the legislature has to approve it. So we spend it, but we don't decide how much money it is going to be in. Um, we do have planning authority over the seven county metro area, as was, was mentioned, and we also have a small levy of about $13 million. I know that sounds like a lot of money, but in, in the grand scheme of government for the, the whole metro area, $13 million is not a lot of money um, for affordable housing programs for the metro area. So that's kind of what we do. <coughs> Clarify something. You, they do not fund roads, but they do make funding decisions. Uh, federal <coughs> highway surface transportation dollars come down and as a metropolitan planning organization, the Met Council through the, through the tab, makes decisions on which projects get a certain, a certain subset of that money. And over the years, the federal government has allowed more and more of the highway <coughs> dollars to be flexible, which means it could go to highways or to go to transit. And that has set up an inherent conflict of interest where you have an agency which operates the transit system making decisions to take highway monies and give it to transit. You, you are correct that there is a funding mechanism for the federal dollars that goes through the TAB system and it has a kind of distributions through different sorts. In terms of the grand scheme of of transportation funding, it's a relatively small pot of money, and in that particular pot of money, local elected officials are more than half of the people on the tab, which makes the decisions. There are some appointed by the Met Council, but once that comes to us, we can approve it 
or we can send it back and say we want you to keep looking at it. I can't remember a time, that it hasn't happened while I've been on the council, where the council sent it back and said, no, you can't do this, do something different. So that's one that's been a little fuzzy and how it gets described in, in the media. We can, up, we can say yes or we can send it back, but we don't make the decisions on, on because I used to be on the tab when I was a local elected. Yeah. But, but the Met Council staff and through the guiding directions, they set up the tab. They go through the process and they select the projects. But who selects how much money goes into each pot? And that usually comes down from the staff and they tend to get their way, whether that's a Met Council approval or a TAP approval. Uh, every, pretty much every dollar that the federal rules allow to be flexed, to be taken from a highway pot and put into a transit pot, is flexed by the Met Council. As, as, that is not true for the other area transportation partnerships around the state, it is true for the Met Council. I don't have the details on that. Maybe, maybe you should kind of describe your background. Yeah, I, tell us, and sorry, introduce who you are. Right. So, uh, I'm Frank Papko. Mm -hmm. I'm a retired MnDOT employee. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I help, I, I consulted a little, given a thought or two on transportation and Met Council activities, and I also am an occasional guest on Up and Adam as their transportation are. All right, thank you. <coughs> So, John, did that answer your question? <laughs> uh, mostly. The, the two pieces that I'm still missing are, are basically the question of in and out with the money. I heard uh, mention of a levy that the Met Council can, uh, can get, which is only $13 million. Their budget is way more than that. And I'm wondering how much does, does the <coughs> Council get to decide what, what it spends money on? Oh, overall, we have four basic levies. We levy a general levy for, you know, running the council itself. We, we levy uh, for the transportation capital projects where we have to go to the legislature and ask for approval of what particular projects happen. We have a parks levy where we uh, reimburse some of the, the, the regional park agencies for their expenses, for capital expenses. We contribute to what Three Rivers and, and Dakota County and the different regional parks agencies are doing. And then we have that levy for livable communities. But it's overall, the money that we levy is less than 10% of the entire council budget. Most of it is passed through money from the state or from the federal government for various programs that we administer. And one thing that hasn't really been articulated, I think specifically, is that there are four statutory systems that the legislature gave uh, authority to the Met Council for. <coughs> They're obviously wastewater treatment and, and transportation in the way that may be described, and uh, also parks and open space and deviation. And I think one of the issues now is that housing is not a statutory system, but increasingly uh, there is a move by the Met Council through this unprecedented, essentially, housing policy plan to move into that. I think it's the overall plan <coughs> framework and the <coughs> which which the Met Council is is mandated by the legislature to to create and all the local units of government have to uh, create comprehensive plans that essentially mirror or, or take into account that framework. I think that's a, where a lot of this uh, sort of the the, the, the twenty thousand foot vision of, of many people feel the social planners wanting to reorganize in certain respects the entire area. I think it comes under that under that framework. If I can just, just uh, close this, uh, thank you very, very much for all this information. I think uh, maybe everybody else in the room understands all this way better than I do, but I find Met Council as one of these enormous organizations where its boundaries are very fuzzy. Very few people understand or have any idea of what its scope is, what its power is, and it would be a step forward just to know what its powers are, what its taxation is, what it does, what its authority is, just to know you know where those boundaries are, what they do. I'm not sure how they got the authority to tell the city how they have to plan their area. I don't, I just don't get that. And if you could just announce your name. Oh, I'm sorry, David Meyer, uh, from City Vegan. Oh, yeah. It just doesn't make no, sense to me that they would have authority over that. I mean, I understand the sewers thing. Okay, you know, I understand that. And I can even understand a little bit on the roads. But that's what we have MnDOT for, and we have all these other county transportation boards. 
we have all these all these other organizations. So why do we have some other organization trying to tell a city how to plan its city? I don't understand that. Roz? I yes. can't answer him, but I, have I, 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 I want to hear <laughs> Well, and I'll just add, they do come up with a, a plan that is submitted, because they're, they're trying to plan the region, so the cities do come up with a basic plan that they send into the Met Council. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, anybody. I, I can do that. Okay. Okay. The, the state law says that, that we have to update our plan every 10 years, that cities have to update their plans and send them to us. And they're accountable for the things that are that are within our system plans. So if we say this is how the sewer system is going to be, and the city says no, we want to have half as much development or twice as much development where it would not use our sewer system efficiently, we can send it back and say no, that doesn't match the system plan. Same thing with the roads that you have to show like all of the major roads and, and be in compliance with the transportation plan. Same thing with the parks. If there's a trail or a regional park, it's got to be in the plan. That, that's part, of, part of, part of the, the thing with sewers, in order to run the sewer, you have to have at least three units per acre overall, or else it doesn't make economic sense to have the sewer. That's why we have the 40% the below the rest of the country on our, on our sewer rates. How cities want to interpret that within their city is up to them, except that state law also says that they have to plan for a certain affordable housing need. And so they have to have, part of it in, is dense enough to accommodate that need. And I'm sorry, so first we're gonna go to <laughs> Council Member Mary Sherry and then <laughs> I'll stand because I'm so little you can't see me if I'm sitting. Uh, I'm Mary Sherry, Burnsville City Council. Our big concern in Burnsville is uh, housing, but before I talk to speak to that, I want to tell you I'm not a native of the area. When we moved here after many years of being corporate transients, we thought the Met Council was a brilliant idea. We had never lived, we had always lived in big cities and other parts of the country, but we had never lived in a place where the, the sewer system in particular was so well planned and thought out and managed. In fact, I even took my kids to the tour of the Seneca sewer treatment plant. I recommend it, it's fantastic. <laughs> so anyway. Did you drink the water? Drink the water. Is, yeah, I didn't drink the water, but this is not an ad. Now, fast forward, I never dreamed I'd be on the city council, but here I am. Our concern with the city of Burnsville, and I believe, I don't remember if it was you, Catherine, or you, Kim, you mentioned how under the Met Council, housing plan, which we don't know where that came from. Uh, now we have to add so many more units of, of density, <coughs> dense housing. Burnsville is built out. We are 98%, 99% developed. The only thing that's left in Burnsville is what we call the Minnesota River Quadrant, which is where the Kramer Quarry is and the landfill. And there's a little bit of land over there. You might have been reading about that lately because We've just gotten, uh, we hope, what seems to be an agreement to get the old freeway landfill cleaned up and officially closed. There will be a little bit of developable land along there. As the, the quarry gets mined out, that will fill up as a lake. There will be some developable land around there. There is no way on God's green earth, it's not green down there, by the way, uh, that that can accommodate the kind of development that my council is telling us we need. That's first point. Second point is, and I believe you also mentioned this, that we already have uh, almost 70% of our, ho our housing is affordable. If we are expected to put more dense housing in, that is going to make it, sorry to say, even more affordable. This is impacting our schools. It's a vicious circle. It is not under our control. We want it back under our control. Oh, yeah, and one more thing. I have to tell you how much it's costing almost $300,000 for us to update our comp plan. $300,000. very, very long service on the Metropolitan Council. And I agree that our sewer systems are phenomenal. Everybody um, agrees. I think everybody agrees, agrees that we've got a great sewer system. 
uh, back in the 60s, um, I'll speak up. Back in the 60s, the reason why this all started was that the lines weren't hooked up, they weren't meeting up at the borders, and that's ridiculous. So our desire for good government and efficiency uh, led us to create the Met Council. Uh, and Kathy and I have spent countless hours with officials on both sides of the aisle, by the way, uh, who have been around for most of that history. And what they told us is that the original thinking was a, it was a good idea, as you said, and and job well done. Um, one of the things they wanted cities to do in the metro region is come up with a comprehensive plan for the city. And what we've been told by officials in Golden Valley and Burnsville and other places is that that too has been done. The comprehensive plans are in their, what, third, fourth iteration at this point. They'll be based on these, this new system statement. And, you know, at some point, bureaucracies take on a life of their own. And, and this is, I think, what has happened uh, with the Metropolitan Council. And as Linda mentioned, Representative Runbeck mentioned, back in the 90s, the legislature, though it was a hard-fought contest, decided to have the Metropolitan Council take over transit as both an owner and operator of, trans of, of trans transportation. Remember the old MTC system? So, and, and, the, and of course the hope is that they would run that as well as they can do the, the wastewater system. But it, it sets up an inherent conflict as uh, Frank Papco talked about. Um, and the Council, and it doesn't seem to matter who the governor is, uh, seems to be um, on mission overload. I don't know what's the, what's you know mission creep uh, to the point where it doesn't understand. No, we just needed you to clean the sewer water, and we just need an efficient transit system. We don't need you to solve the achievement gap and global warming and look at everything through the lens of whatever. That's not your job. We have local communities, parents, churches, schools, local officials, and a wonderful county government system to handle a lot of the issues. And we've got big issues uh, as a region to deal with. Uh, go, you know, go do your job. Uh, rather than trying to, I don't know, aggrandize. Yeah, I think you get, you get a sense of that from the five sweeping outcomes yeah, yeah. that, that power this drive state, but these are not defined. And they're going to work to, to change in major ways our, our metro area on the basis of these undefined outcomes, quote, equity, sustainability, livability, prosperity, and stewardship and three principles, integration, collaboration, and accountability. Nobody knows what this stuff means, but it does really, really give a sense for the, the reach of planning uh, a perfect society, perhaps, that could be tempting to people uh, who are core professional social planners, which would be as equity staff. Definitely. But how about more questions? Okay, Commissioner Chris Gerlach. Thanks, Russ. Well, uh, I know we're talking a lot about doing a really good job of identifying what problems are and right, such. Right. At some point, we're going to want to talk about what are some solutions Absolutely. that legislators can use. Because that's really what we're directing this at, is legislators and the governor to fix the problem. And the council cannot fix themselves. We know that. So our, you know, the beef isn't always with them as far as the solution. Uh, I have a, uh, um, I can speak to it briefly. But, and I have a handout here. You mentioned that uh, there's a local government coalition made up of some suburban counties and some cities, and we're hoping to grow that with uh, one solution on the governance piece. And I want to make, you know, if I could, uh, can I set these out? Can I speak to this Please briefly? Please do. Yeah, come on up and questions and if I, if I present could. it, because we're <laughs> all, all about here. solutions. There are ideas for solutions. Well, if I, yeah, 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 or if I could. Uh, I'm Chris Gerlach from Apple Valley, and I am a Dakota County Commissioner. 
prior to that, I mean, my, my first term on the county board, prior to that, I did spend 14 years in the state legislature, both in the state senate and the House of Representatives. I'm joined here by two other county commissioners with a, a wealth of local government experience as well. Uh, Mary Liz Holberg, who was in the legislature in the House for 14 years and the Lakeville City Council before that, uh, planning commission before that. And then the I did that too. <laughs> and Liz Workman from Burnsville, of course, before on the county board, Liz served on the uh, Burnsville City Council. Uh, and uh, when uh, the Met Council came out with the Thrive 2040 plan in the uh, fall, summer, fall, when they rolled that out of 2014, the suburban counties looked at that and uh, felt that it did not uh, be kind, did not meet our needs. And we began to uh, meet, and there was an unprecedented meeting of five county commissioners, I mean, all of the counties. All I should say, all of the county commissioners of the five suburban counties got together, had a big meeting, asked the Met Council to come and, and account for this plan they're putting forth, and we focused specifically just on the transportation piece alone. That uh, uh, meeting was, was unique in that it drew counties together uh, in an unprecedented way. However, we never really did get satisfaction on what our grievances were. Uh, but we continued to meet and decided that we would have, uh, uh, on a monthly basis, we got together uh, representatives from the counties and we decided that we would put together <laughs> some solutions for the root cause of what was happening. And what we identified, we said, let's focus first on the governance. We could spend a lot of time talking about the mission and scope, but we wanted to zero in on the governance piece. And what we saw as the key problem was the centralized control of the Met Council. That when the governor holds all the cards, that the Met Council no longer is that regional planning organization or government where you, have, where you have a broad constituency, where you have a lot of people coming together for solutions like was done originally with the wastewater infrastructure problem that everybody praises. We've gotten so far away from that. And in 1994, when the legislature switched from staggered terms to coterminous terms, you hear those terms a lot, uh, that uh, it, it even further concentrated the political power into the governor's office. The Met Council, as we look at it, is nothing more than a state agency. It is the Department of Metropolitan Affairs. The chair is a, is a commissioner. And, the, uh, and that is how we view it. Now, I want to really praise Wendy, because Wendy goes into the, the lion's den a lot, meetings like this every day, and is a fantastic trooper. And she has been a, a great public servant on, on many things related to the Met Council. I thank you for that. And so I, I don't want to be overly harsh on, and, and criticize individuals by any means. This is a civics 101 issue. We're not criticizing any particular governor, because Governor Pawlenty vetoed staggered terms, a low-hanging fruit proposal vetoed that, Dayton vetoed that. Uh, so it doesn't matter what party they're from. We, saw, we see this as, a, as a, a much broader issue and problem to solve, and we're not, we also, we're not criticizing all of the, the policies and the plans of the Met Council. There's a time and place for all of that. We wanted to focus on the governance piece. Uh, so what we did was we came up with some principles. We broadened our group to not just county commissioners, but also cities. We got together with about eight or ten people who were on the city councils or mayors, and we, we uh, it was a for, kind of a phone a friend type approach. We, we knew people were concerned about the Met Council. We got together and we said, let's start a nucleus or a core group and come up with something. We have to have something to start. So that group then, over several months in uh, uh, November, December, January, put together a set of principles to try to offer up a solution to the governance issue, this local governance coalition group. So it's broader than just counties. But we came up with principles that are essentially what they asked for. I'm not going to go through them all, but the, the core is to pull away the centralized political power from a sole individual so that it is not just a state agency, so that it is not just a political tool of the governor, so that when a governor is elected, they can't say, well, I was elected, I have a mandate now, this is just one of my many tools to affect my agenda. That's not what the Met Council is, was designed to be, and it, but it is what it has become. We want to pull that away, and we want to do that by breaking up the monopoly and have local elected officials serve on the Met Council. But it's not, this is very critical, it's not about the governor appointing those people, it's about the shifting the constituency so that now you have people, county boards, sending their people, city councils sending their people to comprise the Met Council. 
So the governor cannot pick up the phone and say, I want this transit line here, I want this housing policy there, I want X, Y, Z, whatever it is, and the council reacts. We want to have this much more of a grassroots organization that's going to exist. There are some benefits, certainly, to regional planning and things. The pendulum has just swung too far. That is what we're about. We have put these principles together in a statement of beliefs, uh, which is very, very um, succinct. In fact, I'm going to read that one sentence. Statement of belief. The Metropolitan Council, due to its taxing and policy authority, should be accountable to a regional constituency of those impacted by its decisions. It should not operate as a state agency, as it does in its current form, answerable to only one person, the governor. I guess it was two sentences. But that is the core, the core belief of what we what we put together here. We put this together in a, a uh, with a sample resolution, and we are testing the waters. We tossed it out to 186 cities and count, you know, and also the counties, seven counties, and said, "Take this, look at this resolution. If you uh, subscribe to this, pass it. Let us know you support it. Let us know. And our goal is to take this along with resolution support to the legislature when the session convenes. And when you have a hearing on this, we'll be able to say this is what we have." and we'll add it to the mix of all the things you're doing. We did not come up with a detailed plan that says, this is how many people, this is how the chair will be appointed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You guys are gonna figure that out. We wanna take whatever comes out of the legislature or the bills and match them up against our principles and do they solve the problem? Not just treat symptoms, but do they actually get to the, to the root disease? So that is what we're about and uh, I just, I will respectfully submit this to all the legislators. You've all got this. Do you have one with you? Does anybody have any questions? Um, yeah, I would. Um, my name is Deborah Emerson. I'm Watertown City Council. Uh, we are in Carver County. Uh, one of the questions that I had is that potentially I see as a city council conflict of interest with a city. It's kind of like moving from having the governor appoint to now having the city council appoint one of their members. Mm -hmm. Has any thought been given to having this become 100% elected, nonpartisan? Mm -hmm. So like we elect our city council members, we elect our mayor, we elect our county commissioners. Yes. Is, has any thought been given to electing uh, the Met Council? And then also just another thing. Can, can I answer that one first? Um, sure, yep. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. The notion of an elected Met Council is different than elected officials being on the Met Council. Okay, two different things. You're saying, well, what about just electing them? And I'll tell you that uh, almost universally, people, have, when they've looked at that, have rejected it. Other than Myra Norfield, uh, I think is probably the only one. Otherwise, everybody has rejected it. And here's, here's the reason is, you solve some of the problems that I'm talking about, but you create many, many more. Now you really do have a whole other level of, of government that is going to justify its existence and you're gonna see an explosion far more than you ever dreamed of. And so to, to control that downside there, we have local governments already and, and they can, can serve that function. And we, we do it in many other ways. The county commissioners serve on, on many or cooperative boards, the, the Metropolitan Emergency Services Board, the Solid Waste Management Coordinating Board, the Mosquito Control District. The, I mean, the list goes on and on. And, and then you, uh, cities do the same kinds of things, and we can do this collaboratively. So, so now your second question. Yep, so then could you just kind of um, talk a little bit about then the other cities in the other states that kind of have this different model and how they may, what their successes or what the pluses or minuses are from having that model? Well, I can tell you that what we know from our research, in fact, in the handout there, you see some pages in the back that compares our Met Council, I think it's from the MPO perspective too, uh, but it's, it shows both with me, you know, within Minnesota and also around the country, and we are unique here. We, nobody else has a solidly appointed Metropolitan Council. We are alone on that. So and under federal law, well, we, yes. not, there's a good that opens up a whole other can of worms with the MPO issue and, and, and such. But uh, our proposal would solve the MPO issue, uh, and uh, so at any rate. But uh, uh, so yes, we are unique around our uh, around the country and how we have it now, and, and we think that that uniqueness is not serving us well. 
Is there a website for your proposal? No, we, we are a, just a coalition of folks loose. We just get together casually, so there's no organization. There is no website. We don't have, uh, I mean, we're relying on our existing staff to sort of kind of cobble together and kind of work together uh, and do what we can to get this out there. And then we go up to the Capitol and uh, testify with uh, the other groups and such. And, um, but uh, no, we don't have any kind of a formal website or anything like that. Chris, can I get a clarification? Um, would, under this model of what you recommend, would elected officials be able to appoint someone to represent them at the Met Council, or do they have to be an elected official? Our proposal, as it is right now, is to have the elected officials be, um, you know, that, that the, the, the local governments would send their own. Okay. We do not specify that it would have, you know, or we can say that it would be elected officials. Okay. We think there's a benefit to that. But what you're what you're saying is, could it be a, another third party appointed? Uh, and and that's 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 an option that you'll have to look at. There are pros and cons to that as well. Uh, and uh, um, but that certainly is an option. But either way, I think me speaking personally and not for the coalition group, but uh, both solve the problem of constituency because they pull that away from the governor. And that's a good thing. That broadens the input, that broadens the constituency, who people are accountable to. So either way is good, and you guys are going to be sorting that out. But point Craig Island from Eden Prairie, resident. Uh, I have an issue with having the elected officials, I, I assume you're saying, of city council appoint, elect uh, a representative to work with the Met Council. Eden Prairie, as a city council, that they say they are bipartisan. But is that, that is not true. That's not anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and I know what they, would, what they would do is to appoint someone that agrees with them. And uh, to me, I guess an alternative would be to elect that representative uh, for the city. Right, exactly. Well, okay, I'll say that's, that's, a, that's a con. There are lots of different models. We specifically did not get into that level of detail because we could spend forever sure. doing that, and we would like to leave all of that fine debate to the legislature because they're so good at that. <laughs> and, yeah, and they'll figure that out. But what you're saying, you're, you're raising different models of how it, the mechanics of how it could be. But what we're saying is the principle, however you do it, needs to pull the, the, that centralized control away from the governor and spread it out to the local governments so, we so can that we can... Out if they not doing what we want. Right? Well, there, there's a different accountability, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's you really it. Yeah. I mean, you're right down to yeah. it. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that appointing an elected official as your first proposal solves that federal surface transportation yes, funding issue, mm -hmm. appointing a non-elected official does not. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. Good point. So that was, that's up the way. <laughs> I have one question for the commissioners and the Met Council. How many hours a week are we talking to do this job? Four. Well, on the council, you would have an idea a, how many hours. That's a good question, and that does come up. Uh, and and I, I'll say this: is that anybody who's elected any office, it's all it's entirely what you put into it. Some elected officials put 150 percent into it, and some put about 10 percent into them. Most are somewhere in you know in the middle there, in the range of it. And uh, the uh, um, the truth is, yes, it's a different workload. But here's how I answered this question with somebody else before. You can't think of our proposal in a vacuum, because if you oh. did, it's a very different thing. Then you're, you're just adding. But you know what? If you had a Met Council that was truly responsive to the local governments of which it is governing, well, then maybe you could take some of the other duties that commissioners and city council members do, and you could then feel better about seeing how you can collaborate better and put them together and, and such and do different things, and you can alter that. You've got to think more dynamically and not in a static vacuum. And I think that goes a long way to solving that workload problem. Do you want to know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Council before I was on the <coughs> council and I was a very involved city council member. I probably spent 20 or 30 at least hours per week um, and I do at least that probably more now. It varies. We have some weeks where because of the calendar works we have no meetings and we have some weeks where every single day I've got at least a meeting every day this week. 
some days too, plus all of the reading and the email and the phone and all of that. So, and I get paid twenty thousand dollars a year, yeah. and that's as a stipend, not as a salary. So I have to pay self-employment taxes out of that twenty thousand dollars a year. It's not a money maker by any stretch of the And and if you put that with a eight thousand dollar a year city council salary doing you know the kind of workload that they do I mean you can be getting the earned income tax credit and be working you know 60 hours a week yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that why they want the affordable housing yeah. <laughs> um, I just had a question about I mean please announce your oh I'm sorry very well check um, I just had a question about the number of people um, that would be on the Council that you're projecting, would it still be the same number of people? Would it be more because there is 187 users? So or to is that just part of the minutia you're not getting into? That's your second part. Yes, <laughs> we are not getting into that. That there, there are there are countless ways in which to build that and to do that. And what we're interested in is is the cure of the of the problem. And there are ways in which to work all that out. How do you, I mean, we, uh, I've had conversations with people about this, you know, well, how do you balance out uh, voting with Hennepin County and Carver County? Uh, how do you, it was, it was reminiscent of 1787, of course, with you know, large states and small states, and how do you do that? And of course, they had the Great Compromise in the House and the Senate and such, but somehow, but they're a model CTIB, although it's difficult to hold together sometimes, but there are, that, that is a unicameral wing and voting system whereby uh, you have to have, uh, you know, the larger counties have to have a smaller suburban county as part of a majority vote in order to enact them. So you know, there's ways to do all of this. We are silent on all those details, uh, and uh, we just want to make sure that, you know, there's lots of ideas, and, and uh, we're not the smartest people in the room, but we know we have to solve the representation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not the smartest one in the room. Okay, and we just remind you as we consider the task that would be before a newly governed council. It doesn't have to try to do everything it's trying to do right now. Well, so remember that our legislators can be asked to curtail and shrink the mission of the council as well as its budget. Question. Um, I, I have a question about the, my name is Louis Kite of Canadian. Is it for me or am I done? Um, I don't know. Maybe right here. <laughs> um, the 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 young lady from uh, on the city council over at uh, Burnsville. She's gone. She's gone. She's gone. She, was, she was talking about a, a level of uh, affordable housing in in Burnsville, which is at about seventy percent. So when you when you start creating that density of affordable housing in your build out um, you're essentially creating poverty centers so how many middle and upper income units does it take tax wise to support one uh, affordable housing unit this is the kind of the hidden problem with this whole thing. Well, it's not hidden. You're hidden, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, but I, but I can give you some. Oh, well, I'm Mary Liz Holberg. I've been in the trenches a long time. I was first put on the Planning Commission in Lakeville in 1989, so that means I've been through three system plan updates and comprehensive plan updates. Smart growth, new urbanism, I mean, name your you know, poison of the decade. Um, but what I want to say is that in the early 90s, when Lakeville was looking at updating their comp plan, they wanted to learn from the communities uh, that had gone before them, that were farther along in their development. And intuitively, uh, there was, this is what Meyer and Orfield wanted the density, the low income. And so Lakeville, uh, part uh, initiated an unprecedented study in the community. And what they did is they looked at 10 to 12 taxing jurisdictions within the community from uh, lower valued homes to uh, properties at the industrial park, um, commercial property, uh, mobile home parks. And what they came to uh, the conclusion, and then what they did is that they quantified the costs 
of providing public service to these various types of property classifications. And in the mid-90s, the, the resolution or the conclusion to all of that work was that if you were a property, a residential property in Lakeville at that time, and if you were not valued at $142,000 or more, then you were consuming more city services than what your property taxes were paying for. And so the Lakeville said, well, when at that time they, they had a standard of 85 foot lots. Uh, we were doing over a thousand units a year in new housing. The town was exploding. And they recognized that if they didn't provide a balance of new development in the community, that they would continue to have to raise property taxes if they didn't have a balance of new development. And so they took certain areas of the community, uh, made some larger lot sizes, tried to solicit um, what some might refer to as McMansions. These lots certainly weren't high density homes on transit corridors, um, but they were able to kind of balance out the hot housing stock that was built and in turn uh, protect the fiscal health of the community and not have to rely on continual property tax increases to provide the same level of service. So there are some real <laughs> hidden costs, and then let's jump ahead another decade just for a, oh, oh what can really happen that's scary. When you look at when the land was constrained because of the urban service area, and the economy was booming, think the early 2000s, what was happening? Where did we see huge growth? Right outside the seven county metro area. Gas was cheap. Um, St. Michael, New Prague, um, those communities exploded with new development because land was constrained within the seven county area for single family homes. And then what happened? The economy crashed. And these communities suffered. And a lot of people lost a lot of money. And so to the degree that these planning standards don't reflect the market, you can see a lot of problems on that level as well. And so this new round with 2040 doesn't even begin to address what is the demand. It says we are going to demand what you get. And the unintended consequences, not only is most of this housing subsidized in some way, shape, or another with uh, public tax dollars in order to get it built in the first place, you also have the subsidy on the long-term costs of supporting <laughs> services for these high-density, uh, low-income. And if communities aren't allowed to build a range of housing stock within their communities, they will get less and less able to Pardon the pun, thrive. <laughs> I, I appreciate that answer. It didn't answer my question. You you were saying the, the balance of the density, 70 30 is not a balance. No, that's where Brunsville is okay, now. That's right. 70% high high density, 30% uh, medium or, or low density or whatever it might be. That's not a balance. Right, and that's what Lakefield cool. wanted to avoid and what they tried to learn yeah. from when they watch what was happening in Burnsville, Apple Valley. Well, my question to her was, how many uh, middle, upper middle, and upper income units does it require to support the needs of one affordable house? In other words, you need more tax revenue <coughs> here to support one of these what is the position of uh, the Met Council in creating that balance to where a, a community isn't taxed out of their pants? Are you taxing the seniors right out of the city meeting if we go back that Well, I want the answer from her. <coughs> I don't have an answer because we don't have a policy for that. The, with the need number that communities have to... No, just let me finish, okay? 
with the need number that communities have to plan for with, with their comprehensive plan, everybody acknowledges that that number is never going to be filled. But it's in state law that everybody has to accommodate their need. And if the legislature wants to change, the legislature wants to change that in state law, they can certainly do that. But right now it says that cities must plan for that need. We didn't make that up. The, the legislature did it. It's in state law. So I get this straight. So this, the legislature said that we have to plan for this need, but the city councils don't have to act on it at all. Most of so the we money. We spend a bunch of money making a plan we're never going to act well, on. Most of the plan actually ends up being useful. I was on the Lakeville City Council after Mary Liz. I, I followed her. When she left to go to the City Council, I went to the Planning Commission. And then when she went to the Legislature, I went to the, the City Council. So I've been involved in almost as many comp plan updates as, as Mary Liz has. And I actually visited uh, New Alm as part of a council member exchange and saw how they do things. And they don't have a comprehensive plan. So they make stuff up as they go for every single development that comes through the pipeline. And when you're doing a thousand units a year, you better have a plan or you're gonna have a disaster. So the cities need that plan whether or not the whether or not state law required it. We we certainly found it useful in Lakeville to get through development questions having those plans in place and Lakeville would not be the great place that it is if we didn't have that plan in place. But as far as the, the planning goes, if the legislature wants to change that, they certainly can. Okay, well, I, I have a, a piggyback question on that. And that is, right now, the city of Eden is in the process of speaking forward. Are you familiar with it? That's the rubber okay. what, what I uh, When I attended the first meeting, the consultant that they hired from Madison, Wisconsin, came along and told us we have some sidewalks and we are now going to start tearing things down and we are going to build up. Sounds to me like a little, little St. Paul or little Minneapolis. The whole thing which is not thought of is that we're in a flyway. We have one 10 story building in Egan. And it's too tall. <laughs> okay, and just in little time, we've got a question over here, really quick, and then I definitely want, and I got someone back there, so go ahead or maybe a comment. Uh, comment. I'm Susie Jeffrey from Friends with Cold Water. The Met Council has designed a sewer project that is in direct violation of state law. Hmm. Hmm. Great. Hmm. And the gentleman in the back. <laughs> Me. I'm coming down with cold. Uh, this room needs to know that the Myron Orfield plan of, of relocating large numbers of low income peoples into the suburbs is, is coming under attack, increasingly coming under attack by affordable housing advocates and low income advocates because they don't want to be. They moved out of their neighborhoods. They would just as soon stay in their neighborhoods. And in the case of North Minneapolis, there are a substantial number of vacant lots that at this rate are going to wind up going at market rate, in which case low income people will have to move somewhere. So we're fighting to try to get transit oriented development within the city of Minneapolis and working on affordable housing along with some market rate housing, obviously, within the city. To me, that's more efficient. You're talking about resources, your police, fire, sewer, et cetera. It's all gonna be more efficient if everybody is dense in that area rather than spreading them out. Another, another issue is when you put people out in the suburbs, you force people to buy a car and make a car payment or buy a second car and make a second car payment. So that's an issue that we have. With the, I'm with the Minneapolis Bicycle Coalition. That's an issue that the Bicycle Coalition has. And then the third thing, uh, everybody's assuming that most of the jobs will remain in the suburbs. But if you've been following the paper, there have been a substantial number of companies relocating from suburban areas into city limits. So you want to make sure when you're doing all your planning that you are not two and five years behind what the millennials and younger people want to do. Thank you. So 
But you can see what we're dealing with. <laughs> Uh, my name is Tony Albright um, from Prior Lake, but I also am the chair for the uh, Commission for Legislative uh, Metropolitan Governance. So I have the happy task of chairing one of the commissions that looks at the Metropolitan Council. Uh, to the gentleman's point in the back, I think you know what you're hearing is a frustration on the part of a number of communities to uh, be autonomous, to be self-governing. Isn't that the American experiment that we all want to participate in? And then that's really what, what our state legislature really hopefully espouses to and what the Center for American Experiment uh, really prides itself on identifying. But we're thrust into a situation where, candidly, we are the victims of our own demi uh, decisions. If you go back to when the Metropolitan Council was first started, it was candidly started with the best of intentions. We needed somebody on a regional perspective to take over the treatment of the sewer water. Seems simple enough, right? And they do a fantastic job. Uh, the, the metrics and the numbers bear that out. But as we have gone along in the legislative body, we have, and I include myself in this and the folks in the back, and I see some former legislators, don't leave just yet. Uh, <laughs> Your old grandson out here. So. Sorry, you can't compete. With You're excused. <laughs> <laughs> we have, candidly, we have abdicated our responsibilities. We have not taken the hard votes and we have not gone through the deliberative process of making the good decisions that would have affected, I think, better policy. We've, sh we've shuttled it off to an agency that, by our own admission and, and decision, has grown far larger than what it was initially uh, determined to be, with controls and, and, and a budget uh, for uh, parts of policy that really agree with uh, the, the citizens that they uh, are in charge of. And so my charge as chair is to take a look at that. Uh, we had. Uh, a commission meeting here about a month ago and the outcome of that is really to say that it isn't so much about right now the, the process of reining in dismantling you can use any adjective you want uh, really the function that we are charged with right now as uh, Mr. Noble really so eloquently put before our commission is it's really about determining the governance of that agency and what do they govern and so if you uh, look on the House File 2467 or in the packets uh, that have been provided to you, I'm not sure if you all hold those, there are any number of uh, legislative initiatives, both on the Senate and on the House side, that really identify with the concerns that you've all expressed. Uh, House File 2467, uh, to the credit of uh, uh, the commissioners in the room, uh, really goes to the meat of, of that, identifying that we do need staggered terms that are not coterminous with the, the governorship. We also need to identify that uh, there are uh, appointed elected people uh, to that body that give reflection upon the, the parochial nature of the decisions that are made at the local level, but also you need to reflect upon the regional effects that uh, a planning commission like the Metropolitan Council is really charged with. Because in a grand sense, we're not just about competing with uh, Iowa, Minnesota, or South Dakota, North Dakota, Wisconsin, we're global. We have to understand that in a, in a global perspective, we've got to plan for the opportunities that we want to avail this state to on a, on a long-term basis. That goes to regionalism. Now that word, as has been said in the past, sometimes gets a bad rap. And I'm not to here to dispel the fact that I don't entirely agree with that sentiment. But what I will say is that regionalism has a function under the proper controls. But unabated, without any type of oversight, regionalism can run amok, and that's what we're faced with. And so, uh, I, I want to encourage all of you in this room, I'm going to end my remarks, uh, and with your desire to rein in and 
modify and, and bring into a reflection of contemporary nature what the Metropolitan Council does. Uh, we have some initiatives that are bipartisan in nature, both coming from the majority in the House as well as the majority in the Senate. That being said, that would recognize that we have senators of a democratic nature and representatives of a Republican nature that are identifying with the very nature of the problem that we face and are signing on to initiatives that will hopefully start to rectify that situation. Uh, the Citizen League is involved, the county commissioners are involved, and we do see an opportunity to have a, a forthright and honest conversation with the governor, sitting governor, uh, about this matter as he talks about what legacy he would like to leave before he uh, finishes his term. So uh, I want to thank uh, Representative Peterson for uh, setting this up. I want to thank her for, for her leadership at the, at the, at the House. Uh, you have very good Uh, Senator Hall, is he still here? Yep, he was. Uh, I had a conversation about this very subject with him this morning, so when he gets back in the room, but you know, we're going to stay around afterwards because this was uh, purposed as a listening session, uh, and, and quite frankly, we've got our ear full, uh, <laughs> both in a positive way, but I hope that you hear uh, that it is not a small task. And rather than sit down uh, thinking that you're going to consume the entire buffet, I would encourage you to uh, understand that we need to go in steps uh, and, and, and have some small successes uh, that incrementally accrue to a larger success that uh, would bear it out over the number of years. So with that, I will thank you for your time. Thank you for this audience and turn it back to, to Ross. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, thank you so much. Important issue. The conversation will still continue on. I know that we had some people here from the real estate and development industry that maybe didn't have a voice, but I know that your concerns are uh, definitely heard at the state legislature and we'll continue on that conversation. Thank you for providing some solutions because we're all looking for some ideas that will work. Um, just from a logistic standpoint, we have this room up until 6 o'clock where there literally will be a group meeting in here at 6 o'clock. So um, uh, we want to thank the library for providing this wonderful space at no cost. This is one of the few places left in this area that is uh, no charge, but we have to get it back into order so the next group can uh, use it. So thank you again for being here. Obviously our doors are open, so don't hesitate to contact us at any time. Thank you.